Welcome to Dig, a history podcast. It's difficult to think of instances of cannibalism that don't elicit the immediate disgust and disapproval that have come to characterize the taboo. Unlike the term anthropophagy, which literally means people eating, the term cannibalism seems to have meaning beyond the anthropological, suggesting someone who eats people ravenously, barbarously, and revels in their animalistic deviance. But still, there's something about cannibalism that people are drawn to. The early years of the internet saw dozens of cannibal hoax sites, such as manbeef.com, which pretended to sell human meat to any of the 500,000 daily visitors to the site. Historically, cannibalism served as a tool to enforce social order on disordered individuals, such as suspected witches, sex workers, Jews, and, after the discovery of the New World, remote and uncivilized savages. Anthropologist William Ahrens puts it this way, What could be more distinctive than creating a boundary between those who do and those who do not eat human flesh? Until recently, cannibalism was used as a relatively uncontroversial way of sorting people into the categories of civilized and uncivilized. Around 1580, Renaissance philosopher Michel de Montaigne lamented the hypocrisy of Europeans who labeled indigenous Americans and Australasians as savages due to ritual cannibalism. Quote, I am not sorry we note the barbarous horror of cannibalism, but grieved that, prying so narrowly into the Tupinamba's faults, we are so blinded in ours. I think there is more barbarism in eating men alive than to feed upon them being dead, to mangle by tortures and torments a body full of lively scents, to roast him in pieces, to make dogs and swine, to gnaw and tear him in mammocks, as we have not only read but seen very lately, yea, and in our own memory, not amongst ancient enemies, but our neighbors and fellow citizens, and, which is worse, under pretense of piety and religion, than to roast and eat him after he is dead. <laughs> so, yeah, Montagna is sort of like, well, we do really messed up things, usually to, like, criminals or suspected witches or whatever. Right, he's talking about brutality not about cannibalism right. so he's saying like look at all these horrible things that we do to people's bodies isn't that worse than actually eating them after they're dead right if you like aren't the one <laughs> yeah. who killed them there you're just right saying, <laughs> right um Cannibalism gave imperial powers compelling justifications for their colonial endeavors. Indigenous Americans and Australasians were backward, uncivilized, savage, and ritual cannibalism served as proof of their need for a guiding hand, right? That is the, that's the, the logic behind colonialism. But it's not that easy. Why? Because right at the moment when Europeans were using cannibalism to demean indigenous cultures and justify their civilizing missions, they too were engaging in cannibalism. So were most of the ancient civilizations around the Mediterranean, the Middle East, and Asia, but under the guise of therapeutics. This week's episode will focus on cannibalism's most quote-unquote civilized iteration, but also its most widespread, and that is medicinal cannibalism. It's true for thousands of years all over the world, the human body has been both the object of medical treatment and an ingredient in its therapies. I'm Marissa. And I'm Sarah. And we are your historians for this episode of DIG. <laughs> Literary scholar P. Kenneth Himmelman, who is more concerned with the cultural meanings of cannibalism than the actual social phenomenon of anthropophagy, has defined four different types of cannibalism. First is cannibalism as a result of starvation, such as that which we saw in Jamestown during the starving time, 
1846, which marked the stranded desperation of both the Donner Party in the Sierra Nevada and the Franklin Expedition in the frozen waters of Arctic Canada. I'm going to interrupt you. We talked about this in our Northwest Passage episode. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And I didn't realize until I was looking up the years for this that the Donner Party and the Franklin Expedition were the same year. Oh, I did not know that. I never put that together before. Is that not lunacy? That is really strange. That the two, like, biggest, you know, modern cannibalism extravaganzas <laughs> were in the same year. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. And I've never seen anything that, like, looks at them both, like, how, how both of those events happening in 1846 mm-hmm. sort of got into people's brains or how right. they made sense of that. Like, It must have been quite a year for cannibalism. People must have been, like, really freaked out about it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So that so that's the first kind of cannibalism, right? You're driven to it through starvation. Mm-hmm. Second is cannibalism committed by the diseased, deranged, or perverse. So today's most culturally important cannibals like Jeffrey Dahmer or Hannibal Lecter tend to fit into this category as they kind of walk this Freudian line between insanity and sexual perversion, right? There's this weird sort of post-Freudian weird sex perversion thing uh, going on with those cannibals, right? Um, Third, we have ritual cannibalism. So this is most often ascribed to remote or primitive societies of the past, like the Caribs in the West Indies um, in the 1490s, or the Foray tribe in New Guinea, which struggled with prion disease as a result of their mortuary cannibalism. And I think that was in like the 80s and 90s or something. I mean, I remember it being on the news myself. However, many anthropologists have argued that the Eucharist, which Catholics believe transubstantiates into the actual flesh and blood of Christ, also qualifies as ritual cannibalism. Mm-hmm. And, and I've heard that from opponents of Catholicism, mm-hmm. like, like you know, whether people who are, you know, sort of anti-religion using that as like, a, well, Catholics are weird and gross too, mm-hmm. but also from <laughs> Protestants yeah. saying like, this is uh, an example of how Catholicism is warped and backward and an inappropriate, like a, a bastardization of the church, mm-hmm. which is so strange because Protestants have very, very similar practices right Mm -hmm. they still take what the eucharist or they take um communion but they just don't believe in transubstantiation but right this is this is my like weird theology they just believe it's symbolic right exactly yeah which okay fine but even then if you were to actually poll any like mainline protestant congregation you would have people all over the board like you would have people some people believe no, it absolutely is transubstantiation. That's it. And then you'd have people who are like, no, it's purely symbolic. And then other people who are like, oh, I think it's kind of both. So I don't know. It's very interesting. Mm-hmm. Have you, I can't remember what I was looking <laughs> It was some Reddit thread about um, like how many, how many wafers would you have to eat to eat a whole Jesus? Yes. <laughs> and they <laughs> called it that, yeah. a Christ cracker or a Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> which I've oh never heard that, and I really I like it. <laughs> um, That's great. Anyway, anyway, the final type of cannibalism, and the one that we'll focus on here today, is medicinal cannibalism. Medicinal cannibalism refers to the practice of consuming human anatomy for therapeutic purposes. Medicinal cannibalism developed out of the widespread understanding of the human body as powerful. The body is a strange thing, really, because it does not sum up a person. Once someone suffers anatomical death, their remains are no longer them. They've lost something, whether it's a soul or some other kind of animating force. And for that reason, the body is a liminal space, which means it's in between. It's fancy academic speak for an in-between space, right? That divides the, the material world from the spirit world. This reality gives the body a kind of power. Himmelman has this great quote that really clarifies what we're talking about here. Quote, medical attention to the body is necessitated by its deterioration. Medical use of the body is made possible by its spiritual occult properties. Mm -hmm. Which so will and we'll see this that 
um, medicinal cannibalism, it, yeah, it's, it's sort of, um, there is something spiritual or religious about it, um, inherently, um, even though it is also medicine. So we'll see why that is when we talk about Paracelsus, one of our faves. Moving. I love Paracelsus. Always the best. So, um... Perhaps it's due to the fact that all humans have the body in common that medicinal cannibalism developed independently all around the world. Indeed, many of the instances of ritual cannibalism among indigenous folks which were condemned by Europeans and Asians were instances of medicinal cannibalism. This, of course, went unrecognized by people from the quote-unquote old world, who neglected to ascertain the motivations behind the instances of cannibalism that they witnessed or heard about through word of mouth. Sir Walter Raleigh wrote extensively about um, New World cannibals during his 1597 expedition to Guyana, um, but his anecdotes suggest that they were quasi-medical, quasi-spiritual motivations behind the instances of cannibalism that he encountered. For example, Raleigh said that the Arawak Indians, quote, beat the bones of their lords into powder, and their wives and friends drank it all in their several sorts of drinks. Keep in mind that that would have been, um, they were doing this to their um, most powerful and now deceased leaders, right? So there's Mm -hmm. obviously some kind of power Mm-hmm. Um, and it's possible that the Arawak were imbibing the qualities or powers of their slain lords by ingesting their bones. This will sound very similar to the medicinal cannibalism practice in Europe and Asia later on that we're going to talk about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it reminds me a lot of our conversation just in the last episode of mine that we did together about um, how some Native American tribes thought about sex. And that by having sex with with a powerful man, you were sort of taking in some of their mm-hmm. power from their body, and then you could pass it on to other right. people through this this through mm-hmm. intercourse. So there's there's definitely something there um, about about bodies and power and kind of taking it in taking power into yourself through these different ways of 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 kind of, I don't know, bringing bodies into your own yeah. body, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, incorporating someone else's body. Right. Yeah, and I think um, it doesn't sound very scientific to us now, um, but really it sounds very similar to the European and Chinese science that was contemporary to those people. Um, mm-hmm. You know, scientific medicine as we know it is very a very recent thing. And so mm-hmm. you'll see that... Even, you know, scientists, trained physicians who were at the top of their game um, buy into practices like this themselves. Yeah, definitely. The Piratu of Venezuela did something similar. After vanquishing enemies in war, they dried and powdered their enemies' hearts and added the mixture to chica, a fermented drink. This practice, initially understood as an act of consuming their barbarous trophies, can also be understood in the medicinal context. It's possible the Piratu believed that they were ingesting the life forces of the foes they had vanquished, making them stronger and wiser. The Bimin Kuskuskin, who lived on the islands now known as the Bahamas, performed mortuary cannibalism, or eating of the dead, which was thought to maintain reproductive health. When a person's spouse died, they typically ate the dead spouse's genitals. Tribal elders ate the reproductive organs of other elders, usually the hearts of male elders and the uterus or the vaginal canal of female elders. They believed that this ritual recycled the procreative powers of the dead, redistributing the reproductive abilities of the dead to the remaining community. Right. Which actually kind of makes sense. (laughs) Yeah. It has a certain, it really does have a certain logic to it. Even though it's like shocking to think of. Right. Right. Um, So in a sense, much ritual cannibalism was medicinal cannibalism based on an unrecognized indigenous medical system rather than that of Western medicine. Keep in mind that prior to the 19th century, Western medicine was arguably just as unscientific um, as any system found among indigenous Americans or Australasians. So privileging Mm -hmm. Western medicine over the medical understanding of indigenous folks makes little sense. 
In actuality, historians are just starting to realize that the medical capabilities of so-called primitive folks, that's usually, it's called primitive medicine, um, were far more advanced than we ever could have realized. Um, So keep these indigenous examples in the back of your mind as we go on to discuss medicinal cannibalism in Europe and Asia, and we'll refer back to them when we can as we see differences and similarities. Recall, um, again, that handy quote by Himmelman um, that we mentioned above, quote, medical attention to the body is necessitated by its deterioration. Medical use of the body is made possible by its spiritual occult properties, end quote. So we can see this operating among indigenous American cultures from the anecdotes, um, but what about the older, more hierarchical and complex societies that make up what is often called the Eastern and Western worlds? or the Orient and the Occident, um, more old-fashionedly. Yeah, this holds true for those societies as well. Traditional Chinese medicine developed cannibalistic prescriptions for a whole host of diseases. Menstrual blood was used to treat hot disease, yellow diseases, and acute delirium. Human blood was also used as an ingredient in medicine to treat diseases causing bloody sputum and postpartum blood loss. Bone and bile from the human gallbladder were used to treat wounds from traumatic injury. Human liver treated night blindness. Mm. (laughs) And human placenta treated sexual impotence and lunacy. Corrected Pharmacopoeia, published in 739, recommended the ingestion of human flesh to treat diseases causing physical debility and muscle atrophy. In these cases, human flesh was used as either the only or primary ingredient in a pharmaceutical preparation, meaning ancient and medieval Chinese weren't grisly bearing raw human body parts. Rather, they were ingesting pharmaceuticals as prescribed by their physicians, and those pharmaceuticals just so happened to be made out of human ingredients. So there's a level of manipulation and processing in between Uh, the corpse from which the parts were harvested, and the ingestion by another. This level of processing is what allowed people from the old world to conceptualize medical cannibalism as something entirely different from the medical-slash-ritual cannibalism of the indigenous groups we described a few minutes ago. To some, that difference is enough to convince them that these instances of human flesh consumption are entirely different from those in indigenous American and Australasian societies. But this distinction all but disappears if one includes the practices of koku and kokan under the umbrella of medicinal cannibalism. Koku refers to the practice of cutting flesh from one's thigh or leg and feeding it to one's ailing parent. Kokan is the same practice, but rather than the flesh being taken from the thigh or leg, part of one's liver is excised and fed to their parent. Some of you may have already encountered this fascinating practice if you read Amy Tan's Joy Luck Club. Have you read that? I have not. Oh, I had to read it in high school, I think. Yeah, I know it's it's a commonly assigned book, but Mm -hmm. I have never read it. Yeah, that this happens in there and it's like, Oh, my God. Um, So in that novel, the practice is portrayed as common. Most historians believe that it was a common literary trope, yes, but that it was comparatively rare in practice. Still, we know that koku was or is definitely practiced by real people. Hmm. The practice has been traced to the Tong Dynasty, 618 to 907 CE, but became much more common under the Ming, which existed between 1368 and 1644. In the 700s CE, the physician Cheng Song Chi became the first recorded Chinese physician to prescribe human flesh. There were three important aspects of koku and kokan that were required for the treatment to be effective. Number one, the act must be voluntary. The donor had to be willing to donate their flesh or liver tissue for this purpose. Number two, the donor and the recipient must be closely related. The donor was usually a child or a child-in-law and the recipient an ailing parent. And number three, the recipient must not know that they are eating human flesh. The human flesh or liver tissue must be disguised as ordinary food, so the recipient does not observe the usual taboo of eating human flesh. 
There are also a few important caveats here if we're categorizing Koku and Kokan as medicinal cannibalism. Of course, the donor is still alive, which stands in stark contrast to routine instances of medical cannibalism where the human material is harvested after death. This means that in the end, the donor is exalted and glorified for their selflessness and bravery. When human material is harvested from a corpse, however, they have no personhood. The corpse is merely material with therapeutic properties, and they can neither consent nor decline their donation. Another thing to point out is that this is done in a private setting, at home, not in an institutional setting like other forms of medicinal cannibalism. If you're wondering what this practice might look like, um, we have one story from 1779 that recurs often in Chinese literature. So it's likely been exaggerated and some parts of it fictionalized for effect. Um, but it gives us an idea of how real uh, instances of koku or kokan might have proceeded. A woman named Liu was home alone with her mother-in-law in Husun County, Hupa. Her mother-in-law became gravely ill, and none of the medicines prescribed by her physician were working. Liu cut a piece of flesh from her thigh, added it to a konji, which is a rice pudding, and fed it to her mother-in-law. The ill woman immediately recovered, but suffered a relapse ten days later. Liu cut even more flesh from her thigh and prepared the meat into meatballs, which she again fed to her mother-in-law. The ill woman recovered for a somewhat longer time, but again relapsed. In her desperation, Liu prayed to Quan Yin. Um, it, this is the Ming goddess of mercy and later a female bodhisattva. I'll mention her again in a minute. Um, and she offered herself in her mother-in-law's place. Their physician witnessed Liu's desperation and told her that ordinary medicines were no use. The only thing that would save her mother-in-law would be an offering of Liu's liver. Shortly after, Liu made an incision under her armpit and accessed her liver, cutting off a piece of it before promptly fainting, which, not surprising. Right. <laughs> at all. <laughs> so, while Liu was unconscious, Quan Yin appeared before her and anointed her wound, saying, My child, you have suffered much. When Liu awoke, she cooked the liver and fed it to her mother-in-law, who made a full recovery. Scholars believe that Koku and Kokan had cultural currency in China because of Confucian and Buddhist influences. Koku was the ultimate instance of filial piety, or deference to one's elders, which was a moral imperative in Confucian China. The rise of Koku can be traced to the introduction of the Buddhist cult Quan Yin during the Ming Dynasty. This is because the practice fit in well with Buddhist ideas of self-sacrifice. According to legend, the child Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, cut off three pieces of flesh from his arm to feed his starving parents. The widespread practice of asceticism and filial piety around Ming China allowed for the practice of koku to occupy an important place in Chinese culture and medicine. As you could see from the story of Liu from 1779, Koku was neither entirely medical nor entirely spiritual. It was a combination of both. Most pre-modern medicine blurred this line between the medical and spiritual world. In primitive societies, shamanism represented a complete overlap of these two worlds. But even quote-unquote Western medicine during classical antiquity, the medieval and early modern periods, neglected to separate these two worlds for most of its history. As we've mentioned in previous episodes, much of Western medicine builds off the ideas of Galen, a Roman physician from the 2nd century CE. Greco-Roman medicine held that the human body was made up of the same elements as all the natural world. Illness was understood as some kind of disruption of the body's natural functioning, and the ultimate healer was nature itself. Therefore, most Greco-Roman therapies were aimed at supporting the body during the natural healing process. Since the body was made up of the same elements as the natural world, it was logical for pharmaceuticals to be produced using elements from the natural world, such as botanicals, as well as parts of the human body. Galen's most influential philosophy was humoralism, the idea that illness was the result of an imbalance of the body's four humors. He believed in the curative properties of contraries, 
Illness caused by an excess or dearth of a certain humor could be cured by consumption or limitation of the opposite humor, respectively. Using this logic, ancient Romans used human flesh and excretions such as milk, blood, urine, menses, and dung as ingredients in their pharmaceuticals. Mmm, delicious. (laughs) One of the most common prescriptions was an elixir of burnt human bones, which was used to treat epilepsy and arthritis. The Roman naturalist Pliny writes of the drinking of blood, called medical vampirism, as a cure for epilepsy. Bathing in human blood was a time-honored prescription for patients suffering from leprosy. Yeah, like, that was just normal. That was just, like, a thing. Mm. Um, Cool, 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 I mean, leprosy had been impacting Europe for, Europe and Asia, really, for over a millennium. (laughs) It's got to, got to take a lot of, uh, it's got to take a lot of blood to take a blood bath. Um, It was probably more of, like, a sponge bath. I hope so. A sits bath or whatever they call it. I would hope. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, Probably only very rich, fancy people were able to get that treatment, though. Rich, fancy people with leprosy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the... That's a weird combo. um, No, it's... But it's not, though, because um, haven't you ever seen... I don't know. During the Crusades, one of the kings of Jerusalem had leprosy really bad. Have you ever seen Kingdom of Heaven? It's about that particular king. Um, So it's not totally unheard of. Interesting. um, And also, people thought any skin thing was leprosy. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So the impulse to consume human bodies for therapeutic reasons continued in Christianized Rome and after the fall of the Roman Empire. Christian Rome adopted an alternate mode of cannibalism, the Eucharist. (laughs) Ha ha ha. That just seems like a very provocative sentence. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so um for the less religiously inclined among us the eucharist refers to the commemoration of the last supper often called taking communion in the christian church the faithful typically eat a piece of bread and drink a small amount of wine or grape juice if you're a protestant what do you guys drink at your uh, we usually have grape juice okay yeah and i i took communion at a mormon church once because my cousins are mormons and they did water really which, yeah Oh, that is interesting. Yeah, no, we use we use grape juice. We don't use wine at my church. Um, and it's been weird since we've been in lockdown because we have to take communion at home. Yeah. And, and I was raised Catholic. So to me, there's st- like you are just drilled with all of these rules about like the, the communion isn't just random stuff. Right. It's this extremely sacred stuff that you, you can't even touch it. And they're it. blessed it's, and everything. Yeah. Like yeah. You, literally you can't even touch it unless you're like trained as a Eucharistic minister. Yeah. And it's and consecrated. It has it's to consecrated. Be. Exactly. Right. Mm. And so it's been so interesting to me as a Protestant to see how like casualized communion is. Like we don't take communion as often. And then there was this one time that will never stop making me laugh and I don't know why I should ask my pastor what this what the story behind this is, but like we always have wafers, like the, you know, just like normal, you know, community wafers. Mm-hmm. And then one time we went in and we had like these big, round like pieces of what they were like molasses cookies, okay, almost. <laughs> and we got these like we had to rip off like a big chunk of this like thick brown bread, basically, and. <laughs> James and I were like sitting in the we sit all the way in the back and we're like still chewing this bread like five minutes later like oh my god what is this stuff so we like joke about that all the time. Like, it's just whatever it's like, they could find yeah, anything will do <laughs> yeah it's funny um yes so okay back to what I was saying yes yeah, um, it was a long diversion no it's fine <laughs> Um, For much of Christian history, that is prior to the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, the Eucharist was understood to be the actual body and blood of Christ. This divine transformation of bread into flesh and wine into blood is called transubstantiation. So some anthropologists argue that for Christian Europe, the Eucharist replaced some of the baser pagan practices of medicinal cannibalism. Mm. Um, In reality, Greco-Roman medicinal cannibalism continued unabated alongside this new Christian ceremony. Mm-hmm. 
For non-believers, the Eucharist hardly seems comparable to the medicinal cannibalism we encountered in China or Rome, but there's more. While Christian Europe continued to use human bodies in their pharmaceuticals, a highly spiritualized version of medicinal cannibalism developed during the process of institutionalization that empowered the Roman Catholic Church. Medieval Catholicism contained many mystical elements that encouraged the ingestion of human flesh and excretions. The bodies of saints were believed to hold the highest measure of spiritual power. It became common for the faithful to seek healing in the form of human excrement or the bodily remains of holy people. Historian Caroline Bynum notes that holy people, quote, spit or blew into the mouths of others in order to cure them or in order to convey grace. Christians suffering from illness petitioned to drink or wash themselves in saints' leftover bathwater, believing the lice and skin which floated in it might depart to them some degree of relief. Occasionally, saints themselves cannibalized others in an attempt to share their sufferings. St. Francis of Assisi kissed the diseased flesh of lepers, and several Italian saints ate pus and lice from the bodies of the poor so as to incorporate their misfortune into their own bodies. Mm. That is some faith. Um, so within the Catholic tradition, the idea is that spiritual power might restore bodily health um, and this is known as ecstatic healing. There's even some evidence that the effectiveness of Greco-Roman medicinal cannibalism was marshaled by theologians to rationalize ecstatic healing. So I have this particular quote that's an example of this. Um, quote, doctors acknowledge that a dead man's parts and members can be put to the same parts and members of incurable patients head to head, mouth to mouth, hand to hand, and will have the power to heal them. Now, if the body of a dead man can possess such virtue, how much more the power of the body of God, who is all virtue, end quote. European executioners often served as informal healers and apothecaries because of their access to human remains slain violently. Apothecaries often complained that their business was undercut by local executioners who took advantage of their position to source human blood and human fat for pharmaceuticals. Public executions served as convenient venues for the sale of human blood. Though these instances of medical vampirism often eludes the historical record, oral histories and folklore assert that in Denmark, ill people attended public executions cup in hand, ready to quaff the red blood as it flows from the still quivering body. Medical vampirism was the primary treatment for epilepsy for hundreds of years. The impetus behind this gruesome practice reaches all the way back to Rome, where, Pliny wrote, epileptics collected warm, living blood from the bodies of slain gladiators. As late as 1747, English physicians were prescribing the drinking of human blood, quote, recent and hot as a cure for the seizure disorder. I've heard this. I've heard this before. Um several times though about executions about people being like ready with bowls and cups to catch the blood mm -hmm. while it was still f very fresh right i think yeah. it was more common in executions of martyrs so mm -hmm. during the period of like um like mary tudor for example in england when mm -hmm. she yes. executed a lot of um protestants like mm -hmm. you know believers would gather there and you know their protestants Protestants would come to not really believe in relics and things, but at the time, mm -hmm. they were new Protestants. They still yes. had some of those old Catholic um, ideas, and yeah, they would collect, you know, fingernails, hair, whatever, like, you know, from yeah, these yeah. martyrs. Um, Edward Taylor, a 17th century Protestant minister in New England, 
wrote that, quote, human blood drunk warm and new is held good in the falling sickness, end quote. Um, strangely, medical vampirism and medicinal cannibalism were particularly popular in Protestant Europe and America. This finding is ironic because Protestants strenuously objected to the doctrine of transubstantiation. And as Sarah said earlier, like used it to be like, look at how horrible Catholics are. Right. Yeah. Um, one of their qualms with the Roman Catholic Church was this doctrine. Rather than communion bread and wine turning into the literal flesh and blood of Christ during the ceremony, Protestants believed that the bread and wine symbolized Christ's bodily sacrifices. Why then were Protestants so keen on consuming human blood and flesh for medicinal purposes? American anthropologist Karen Gordon Grube suggests a really good answer, I think. She says, quote, perhaps for the Protestants of this period, healing with corpse flesh and blood on some level fulfilled a substitute function to that of the transubstantiated flesh and blood, end quote. So what she's saying is that Protestants in the immediate wake of the Protestant Reformation were feeling some kind of loss because of the abolition of the doctrine of transubstantiation. And so their commitment to medical cannibalism kind of filled that void for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One leading historian of medicine, Catherine Park, draws distinctions between Northern and Southern Europe rather than between Protestant and Catholic Europe. Park argues that Mediterranean Catholics and Northern Europeans had very different conceptions of the death process. Southern Europeans, particularly Italians, thought of death as a radical and immediate separation of body and soul. They saw the corpse as inactive and inert. Northern Europeans, however, were more likely to conceive of death as a gradual process by which the soul left the body slowly as it decayed. This imbued the recently dead body with an ethereal and slowly evaporating life force, and it goes some way towards explaining the immense popularity of medicinal cannibalism in Northern Europe. Most folks believed that there was some powerful animating force still at work in recently deceased bodies. This distinction is immediately apparent in many German customs. It was custom in Germanic lands to put a suspected murderer in the same room as the body of their suspected victim. If the body bled or exhibited some other obvious change in his presence, the murderer's guilt was confirmed. This practice suggests that Northern Europeans understood recently dead bodies to be sentient, at least somehow sentient, um, still containing the person or remnants of the person who had once lived inside it. This also explains why embalming in Northern Europe was aimed at preserving the remains from decay for as long as possible while they traveled toward its final resting place. Um, and in most Northern towns, the dissection of the corpse was prohibited. So they want to embalm the corpse and preserve it, but not dissect it and anatomize it, right? Um, because they're thinking of it as still having some of the person in it. Um, while in Southern Europe, the corpse was regarded as an inanimate object of little spiritual value and thus was rarely preserved. Southern Europeans were also more likely to dissect and anatomize corpses than other parts of Europe. Yet Northern Europeans were comparatively comfortable consuming the flesh and blood of their dead. So it's really interesting. That's they're, fascinating. You would Because th they're so weird about, hey, don't cut up this body. There's kind of still a person in there. Right. But they'll eat it. But the eating right. of it, is the the fact that there's still the power of that person in it is what makes the eating of is it. Is why they're eating it. Right. right? It's why. Yeah. This is, this actually answers a question for me too about, um, you know, I, I teach, I teach the, the history of medicine and I spent, a, I spent a good amount of time talking about um, Vesalius and the early um, anatomy work that he's doing in Italy. Um in medical schools there and and like one thing that has always sort of been a question in the back of my mind is like you know why is this happening in italy right when it seems so much even many centuries later is still so taboo mm -hmm. um and this kind of makes sense to me that italians might have conceptualized an, an uh, anatomizing much differently mm -hmm. than uh, Northern Europeans did. So that's that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I know. That's 
And it does, and happens a lot earlier in Spain as well. Mm-hmm. And, like, they're both very Catholic. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but Catherine Park says it's not exactly Catholic versus Protestant. Right. It's it's more northern. It's a regional versus difference. Yeah, yeah, right. And so there is still some of the kind of um, pagan, you know, um, what's the word? sort of i don't know there part of it is like the you know um different teutonic tribes and stuff that settled all around northern europe that it's partly their thoughts of death that have been incorporated Mm. you know like it's not just christianity yeah yeah yeah. medicinal cannibalism became so commonplace in the christian world that outsiders came to associate christians with the practice Jews in Alexandria, Egypt, were recorded as having, quote, marveled greatly at how the Christians were so fond of eating the bodies of the dead. And they would know. Residents of Alexandria were accustomed to witnessing the operations of a robust network established by Europeans for the trafficking of Egyptian corpses. This brings us to the most popular and sought after human ingredient in Western medicine, mummia. The story of mummia, or powdered mummies, is an interesting one because its popularity can be traced back to an unfortunate instance of mistranslation in Greco-Roman texts. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, historian Carl Dannenfeld uncovered this translation error in the 1980s. As it turns out, mummia originally referred to bituminous materials, so bitumen, um, known more commonly as pitch or asphalt, is a black, sticky substance that occurs naturally in sandy landscapes all over the world. Prior to the invention of petroleum distillation, which produces asphalt as a byproduct, natural asphalt was much harder to find. So now it's a very common sort of thing, but that's because we're manufacturing it. In the ancient world, the best-known source for asphalt was a mountain range in Persia, which sits in present-day Darab, Iran. Uh, Ancient peoples found quite early on that this liquid asphalt, it's actually called um, this particular, because there's actually rock asphalt and liquid asphalt, this particular kind is called piss asphalt. Mm. Like, it's literally just the word piss in front of asphalt. (laughs) But I don't want to say that, so I'm just not going to do it. Um, (laughs) um, Ancient people found quite early on that this liquid asphalt had medicinal properties. It was used as an antidote for poisons or to set broken bones. Um, And they called the substance mummia, um, M-U-M-I-Y-A. Mum meant wax in Middle Persian. So they were kind of calling it waxy stuff. The first century Greek physician Dioscorides gave asphalt, especially the bitumen from the Dead Sea, pride of place in his Materia Medica. Pliny the Elder, the naturalist we referred to earlier, wrote that asphalt was used to cure cataracts, leprosy, gout, toothaches, coughs, dysentery, wounds, and quartan fever. As we've mentioned in previous episodes, most of the literature from the classical world was preserved and translated by Arab scholars in the medieval period. Medical texts were no exception. Arab physicians Al-Kindi and Al-Razi wrote about the medicinal uses of asphalt and used the word mummia because it was the colloquial term for liquid asphalt in Persia. The legendary physician and medical theorist Ibn Sina, or kind of the the Europeanized version of his name, Avicenna, agreed with his predecessors, prescribing asphalt, also known as mummia, for abscesses, eruptions, fractures, concussions, paralysis, headache, epilepsy, vertigo, blood sputum, stomach problems, disorders of the liver and spleen, and to treat cases of poisoning. So how did mummia go from meaning liquid asphalt to meaning powdered mummies <laughs> let me guess it has something to do with europeans being dumb <laughs> a little bit yes <laughs> <laughs> so the translation error occurred in the 12th century by gerard of cremona gerard wrote that mummia was quote the substance found in the land where bodies are buried with aloes by which the liquid of the dead mixed with the aloes is transformed and is similar to marine pitch end quote 
Gerard got this from Constantinus Africanus, who a century earlier had printed a, the false translation. Um, Constantinus's error was later corrected, but Gerard must have never got the memo. So this began a comedy of errors where medieval compilers reinforced and promoted this translation error. And the mistake was further obscured by the Muslim pharmacologist Ibn al-Batar in the 13th century when he wrote, quote, that which is called bitumen ludicum and to the mummia of the tombs, which is found in great quantities in Egypt, and which is the mixture which the ancient Greeks used formerly for embalming their dead, in order that their dead bodies might remain in the state in which they were buried and experience neither decay nor change. What he's saying is that Egyptians used this bitumen that was known for medicinal properties in order to embalm their dead. Okay. Right? Which, not true. But because of all these translation errors, nobody knows what the hell's going on. So they're like, oh, well, this is probably what the ancients right. meant by this. Um, even El Batar may have gotten this idea from Pliny, who wrote that asphalt was used in the mummification process, a belief that Egyptologists believed for centuries. In reality, asphalt was used rarely in the mummification process and probably only for poor, ordinary folks rather than important pharaohs. So the idea that Persian asphalt had curative properties survived the translation mistake. But over time, it wasn't just the asphalt that gave mummia its medicinal properties. It was the liquids exuding from the mummified corpses that mixed with the supposed asphalt to create this quote unquote elixir of life. Matthias Silvaticus in the 14th century wrote that mummia quote, is that which is found in the tombs of those embalmed in which the fluid of the corpse dissolves with the aloes and myrrh with which the body is preserved. Carl Dannenfeld, is he a historian? Carl Dannenfeld believes that this literary transformation of mummia occurred parallel to Renaissance Europe's sourcing of medicinal compounds from the Middle East. During the 1400s, demand for liquid asphalt mummia outpaced the limited supply in Persia. Arab physician Abd al-Latif al-Baghdadi sought to reconcile the two disagreeing definitions of mummia by writing, quote, The mummy found in the hollows of the corpses of Egypt differs, but immaterially from the nature of mineral mummy. And where any difficulty arises in procuring the latter may be substituted in its stead. Right. So he's saying, okay, both of these things are called mummia or mummy, but they are very similar, even though they're created and sourced from entirely different things. They are Weird. just both black. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so it comes as no surprise that the 1400s asphalt shortage coincides with an uptick in the raiding of Egyptian tombs and corpse trafficking in Cairo and Alexandria. In 1424, Cairo authorities discovered a horde of cadavers within the city limits. The suspects confessed under torture that they were stealing bodies from local tombs, boiling them in water, and bottling the oily substance that came to rest on the water's surface. When asked why they were doing such a thing, these criminal entrepreneurs said that Europeans were willing to pay 25 gold pieces per hundredweight. Amidst this thriving trade in Egyptian corpses, locals began processing and packaging entire embalmed bodies rather than just the black bituminous materials they exuded. Most corpses were sourced from poor neighborhoods or in the remote desert sands where one could find the desiccated bodies of lost travelers. Poor guys. They like, got lost, <laughs> died in the desert, and now they're being like, mm -hmm. you know, Eaten. ground up. <laughs> Some European physicians actually preferred this form of mummia. Charles II of England's chemist, Nicasius Lefebvre, declared that the best medicinal mummia was made of, quote, bodies dried up in the hot sands of Libya, where sometimes whole caravans were overwhelmed by simoons and suffocated. 
This sudden suffocation doth concentrate the spirits in all parts by reason of the fear and sudden surprisal which seizes on the travelers. Isn't that horrible? Oh, those poor jerks. Right, like yeah. these eating eating these people's bodies is so effective it's, because they were fucking right. scared, terrified when they died. Right? Like that's that's. I mean, think about what is really going on there. <laughs> that's terrible. Yeah, it's crazy. So by 1600. Mummia was widely understood to be processed mummified remains rather than the liquid exuded from mummies or liquid asphalt. Scholars attempted to differentiate between older mummia, um, which was the liquid exudates, as they were called, um, and its new counterpart, which is powdered mummy. Um, but their lamentations fell on deaf ears. They always said, that's not real mummy. This is real mummy. And people were like, whatever. <laughs> um, the 1500s, however, was a time of immense confusion over what mummia was and how it was made. During the 15th and 16th centuries, in part due to the travel narratives written during the Crusades, Europeans were themselves visiting Egypt in large numbers. Medical mummia, which was slowly becoming known as a panacea, which is kind of a cure-all, accounted for much of their fascination with Egyptian mummies. In 1586, Englishman John Sanderson visited the pyramids in search of mummified cadavers. He wrote that the mummies, quote, are like pitch being broken, for I broke off all parts of the bodies to see how the flesh was turned to drug and brought home diverse heads, hands, arms, and feet for a show." end quote like whoa i love how i love how they're like old timey 1500 1600s folks always use the term diverse yeah diverse yeah <laughs> like i brought home diverse heads yeah, and hands all kinds of heads and hands yeah i know right. it's true um, two years later, a German traveler named Samuel Keichel inquired about visiting Egyptian tombs to look for mummies, but his local guides forbade him, saying it was too dangerous. While he was there, however, Keichel witnessed the natives scavenging the tombs daily and taking human remains to Cairo to sell at market. Keichel wrote, quote, one could buy an entire person in Cairo, end quote. <laughs> By the 1500s, we can perceive two different transcontinental mummia markets that had developed, one for the rich and one for ordinary folks. Wealthy and influential Europeans sourced mummia from trusted merchants in Egypt and the Levant and bought the final product in Venice. For example, King Francis I of France carried a mixture of mummia and rhubarb with him at all times. This mummia, often called true mummia, was black liquid extracted from ancient Egyptian notables whose bodies had been preserved with myrrh, aloes, saffron, and other spices. Matter extracted from embalmed virgins was thought to be especially potent. This was a much older trade that accounted for most medieval mummia. Jewish physicians had established a mummia trade in the Levant during the Crusades. They injected corpses with inexpensive asphalt, wrapped them, and cured them in the sun. Word of the lucrative nature of the market spread quickly, and Egyptians found new and inventive ways of sourcing human material. This imitation mummia, made from the asphalt preserved poor, desiccated travelers, and contraband corpses, is the mummia that most Europeans would have been familiar with in the 1500s and 1600s. That's probably not a sentence you ever thought you would say. <laughs> By the mid 1500s, true mummia. Um, as in material sourced from wealthy ancient Egyptians, would have been really hard to find. In 1564, Guy de la Fontaine, physician to the king of Navarre, asked a Jewish mummia merchant about the ancient mummification process that created his mummies, assuming that these were mummies taken out of ancient tombs, right? He was sorely disappointed when the merchant told him that he'd prepared the bodies himself over the course of the previous <laughs> four years. Um, apparently the, the merchant laughed at him and was like, you're hilarious. Um, before long, European physicians and apothecaries observed the astronomical popularity of this low grade mummia imported from Egypt and began making the product domestically in the late 1500s. Over time, the geographical source of the mummia became irrelevant. The Swiss German physician Paracelsus, one of our very favorite gentlemen here, uh, I just love him. Um, and 
I always love to say his whole name, his real name, which was not Paracelsus. It was what? Areolus Philippus? No, Philippus Areolus. No, Theophrastus Bombastus. Yes, something it's, like that. It's, Air, it's von Philippus Areolus Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim. <laughs> <laughs> and every time I say it, I may have gotten the Philippus and the Areolus mixed up, but every time I say right. it in class, my students just like lose their sh- <laughs> anyway, the Swiss German physician Paracelsus, who's a, a one of our very favorites here, um, is perhaps the driving force behind the thriving mummia industry in 16th and 17th century Europe. Paracelsus prescribed both forms of mummia. The true mummia, which may have actually contained some of the bitumen that mummia had originally denoted, and the more common, low-grade, modern mummia made of the corpses of contemporaries. He clearly thought the latter was the more powerful ingredient. Paracelsian medicine, which was heavy on astrology, ascribed the body with unique occult powers. Paracelsus believed that the human body was a microcosm of the universe. To him, pharmaceuticals derived from human ingredients held all of the power of the cosmos. He wrote, quote, nothing can be attributed to the body itself, but only the powers within it. Hence, the power of mummy has been discovered in a variety of experiments. According to Paracelsus, not only must the best mummia be made of the human body, the body must belong to someone who, quote, did not die a natural death, but died an unnatural death with a healthy body and without sickness. The healthier the human was at the time of death, the more powerful his body would be when used as a pharmaceutical. So those poor travelers who were like, ah, suddenly suffocated would be ideal. Yeah, right? exactly. And there's a couple others that would be ideal, which I'll mention in a second. Um, under Paracelsus's tenure, the human nature of mummia was prioritized over the bituminous nature that had initially made the substance therapeutic, right? So um, initially, the idea was that this bitumen was included in it, and now that doesn't even matter. Later physicians in the Paracelsian tradition operating in Europe in the 16 and 1700s had dropped true mummia entirely and adopted the definition of human mummia as the only effective mummia. In the 1600s, the Paracelsian physician uh, Oswald Crolius asserted that mummia was, quote, not the liquid matter which is found in Egyptian sepulchers but rather the flesh of a man that perishes a violent death and kept for some time in the air. (laughs) Yeah, like the second one's so much more reasonable, (laughs) right? Um, So Crolius provided detailed instructions for preparation of pharmaceutical mummia, which involved obtaining the body of a red-haired man. (laughs) No... It's a, I say no older than 24, but he literally just said must be 24. So I don't know if he means... Around 24 Jeez, or whatever. it sounds but like it would be difficult 20. to find an exactly 24-year-old red-haired man. Right. Um, who had died uh, an unnatural death, most preferably hanging or breaking on the oh, wheel. Jesus. The corpse was then to be sprinkled with preservatives like myrrh, aloe, and wine, dried, and then soaked again. This yielded a kind of human jerky that could be <laughs> itself... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> this yielded a kind of human jerky that could be itself consumed or used to make a tincture that was used to cure pestilence and pleurisy. Mm. So the tincture would be that that jerky soaked in, you know, witch hazel or something. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, um, I'm so stuck on human jerky. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, because of these specifications that the corpse must be a healthy young man cut down in the prime of his life executed criminals became an ideal candidate for mummia corpses by 1700 mummia had gone out of fashion in europe thank god no i'm just kidding (laughs) english author john quincy wrote in 1718 although mummia could still be found in medicinal catalogs it is quite out of use in prescription during his travels in egyptian deserts in the 1730s the english richard Pocock commented on the destruction wrought by the mummia craze. He saw many skulls strewn about the desert, quote, many of which probably have been rifled of the bitumen or balsam that was in them when that sort of medicine was formerly much more in use than it is at present. The 1700s saw an effort to record and organize all of the information in the world, 
think of, you know, the advent of encyclopedias. Mm -hmm. So it was during this century that encyclopedists documented what mummia actually was, outlining four distinct kinds. So the first was natural Persian asphalt. The second is the exudate from embalmed bodies that resembled Persian asphalt. So the stuff that came out of mummified bodies that looks like it's black also. Um, Egyptian bodies embalmed with natural asphalt is the third kind of mummia. And then the last kind of mummia is sun-dried, desiccated bodies, such as those found in the desert or prepared by Oswald Crolius and his ilk. But once again, not all physicians got the memo. Some physicians referred to all pharmaceuticals derived from dead bodies as mummy. They use this to differentiate from pharmaceuticals derived from live bodies, such as hair, nails, saliva, earwax, sweat, milk, menses, placenta, urine, dung, semen, and various stones, which were called simples. That is the grossest sentence I've ever uttered. <laughs> And I want to mention, because I didn't get to it in the rest of this, but some of those stones, so some would be like gall stones right, or, or kidney stones whatever. or something. Yeah. But um, one would be a bezoar yeah, yeah, stone. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what oh, that yeah. is? Which is like a gross Were there stone. human bezoars? Because I thought bezoars were specifically yes. from goats. They are common from goats, but there are also human bezoars, yes. Oh, so gross. human bezoars were especially coveted. It's basically like um, hair and you know, um, non-digested right. matter that kind of solidify into a stone. Um, yeah, there are some, there are several human bezoars on uh, display awesome. around the world. The bezoar um, is anyway. what saved Ron Weasley's life in oh, is Harry it? Potter. Yeah, he was, I don't even remember he that. was poisoned. It, it was known, yeah, it's an, it was, it's thought to be an antidote. Mm, exactly. It was not. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> Though mummia was the primary cannibalistic drug on 18th century markets, people were still using various other human parts and excretions for routine therapies. For example, 17th century wives were sometimes prescribed a draft of their husband's urine if they were experiencing a difficult labor. I'm going to hope that that does not happen to me <laughs> next week. Yeah. Human dung was one of the many prescriptions for a phlegmy throat. Menstrual blood, much more accessible uh, than warm blood from a recently slain corpse, it comes once a month, was the <laughs> go-to remedy for epilepsy, pestilence, and skin abscesses. By the 1750s, the bituminous nature of mummia had been all but forgotten, and its effectiveness was attributed almost entirely to the cannibalistic aspect of the drug. Physicians began to delineate which parts of the corpse were effective for which ailments. The Pharmacopoeia Universalis, published in 1764 and compiled by English physician Robert James, describes the therapeutic benefits of mummia like this. So this is kind of a long quote, but it's it's not hard it's not hard to read or understand, and it's really gross okay ready. <laughs> um <laughs> quote mummy resolves coagulated blood and is said to be effectual in purging the head against pains of the spleen a cough inflation of the body obstructions of the menses otherwise abortions um and other u uterine affections such as unwanted fetuses mm -hmm. Um, outwardly, it is of service to consolidating wounds. The skin is recommended. So the skin of the dead, the, the mummy's skin, okay. okay, is recommended in difficult labors and hysteric affections and for withering and contraction of the joints. The fat, meaning the mummy's fat, strengthens, discusses, I don't know what that means, um, eases pains, cures contractions, mollifies the hardness of cicatrices, which are scars, and fills up the pits left by the measles. The bones, dried, um, discuss, astringe, stop all sorts of fluxes and are therefore useful for catarrh, which is like, I don't know, phlegmy cough, I guess. Flux of the measles, dysentery, and leonteri. Do you know what that is? No. Leonteri is diarrhea of completely undigested food. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it mitigates pains of the joints. 
the marrow, right? So the marrow from this corpse um, is highly uh, commended for contractions of the limbs. The cranium is found by experience to be good for diseases of the head and particularly for epilepsy, for which reason it is an ingredient in several anti-epileptic compositions. The triangular bone of the temple is commended as a specific remedy for epilepsy. The heart also cures the same distemper, end quote. So keep in mind that these ingredients, they weren't separated. You know, these bodies weren't like, hey, we'll just take the triangular bone of the temple and mm. put that in it. You know, they, these were all part of the same powdered corpse, yeah. right, that was added to Al or whatever. Um, so it's easy to see why Mamiya was called a cure-all yeah. or a panacea because you're getting all of these benefits in one dead body. Excellent. <laughs> Towards the end of the 18th century, it became increasingly taboo to use human flesh or excretions as medicine. New ideas about heredity made people weary made people wary of consuming the flesh or blood of executed criminals. This concern was nothing new. Even in the 1600s, some physicians believed that drinking the that quote drinking the blood of a criminal who had been beheaded is likely to result in the acquisition of his criminal character and the pursuit of a career in crime. But it wasn't until the late 1700s that ge- that the general public began to take an interest in hereditary medicine and heed this caution. Mummia was still supplied by druggists into the 1800s. The posthumous edition of Samuel Johnson's Dictionary of English reads Quote, what our druggists are supplied with is the flesh of any bodies makers of mummy can get, who fill them with common bitumen and adding aloes and some other cheap ingredients, send them to be baked in an oven till the juices are exhaled and the embalming matter has penetrated. <laughs> as late as 1908, the Merck Group in Darmstadt, which is still a pharmaceutical company today, offered in its catalog, quote, Genuine Egyptian mummy, as long as the supply lasts, 17 marks, 50 per kilogram. Wow. Yeah, like the Merck Group is still a pharmaceutical company. Right, 1908. So there are companies that are pharmaceutical companies today that used to sell mummia. It is crazy. Um, Now, we have established that both the Eastern and Western world have time-honored traditions of cannibalism for medical purposes, but it's worth mentioning the irony of all this. Both China and the various nations of Europe are guilty of using accusations of cannibalism against their enemies in order to justify imperial force. For example, the Chinese accuse Koreans of cannibalism in order to justify their imperial activities on the peninsula. The British accuse indigenous Americans and Australasians of cannibalism in order to justify their colonization of the Americas and Australia, and New Zealand as well. Even as recently as World War II, the Allied powers stoked rumors of cannibalism among the Japanese ranks. The Allies admitted that they were complicit in delivering 300 crates of human flesh to an Allied camp for Japanese POWs so that the Japanese prisoners could feast on the human remains. This does not pass the sniff test, (laughs) but the point is that cannibalism has always been a useful tool when one has an enemy to other. It is such a shocking, appalling practice to most people that it immediately damages any empathy that one might have for others. Some scholars, namely SUNY Stony Brook anthropologist William Ahrens, have argued that socially sanctioned cannibalism among indigenous societies was merely a myth. Ahrens' 1979 book, The Man-Eating Myth, argued that cannibalism among the Caribs and Aztecs were fabricated by their colonizers. He wasn't saying that cannibalism never happened. Rather, he questioned the ubiquity of the practice, its sanctioning by the community, and its centrality to indigenous culture, which, of course, European accounts made much of it, right? Like, Mm -hmm. made it sound like they were just walking around snacking on legs all day, Exactly, yeah. Most scholars now believe that Aaron's was a little too quick to dismiss ritual cannibalism in indigenous societies instead of trying to understand what cannibalism actually meant to them. Right. Like he's automatically assuming this is a bad thing. 
Uh, and so they didn't do it. Right. Whereas the reality is probably more that cannibalism did exist within certain parameters. Right. But Europeans were so like, ooh, this is the exotic, like, almost an Orientalist sort of thing. Is that the mm-hmm. right word? Orientalist? Well, like, I mean, not exactly, but it's... Exoticizing is what I'm looking for, I guess. Dehumanize or to like... um make them seem animalistic right yeah exoticizing is probably the best yeah right so it's it's showing up a lot in european literature but it's because it's these accounts of colonial of of colonizers trying to sort of exoticize and other these people Mm -hmm. that they want to cast as savages right Recently, scholars have suggested that ritual and medicinal cannibalism were quite similar. Using the Bimin Kuskuskin example, where spouses and elders ate the reproductive organs of the dead, um, once you're past the initial shock of what that actually entails and what that would be like, um, it's hard not to see the practice as a medicinal practice, kind of like placenta encapsulation or the consumption of mummia. Placenta encapsulation and consumption of mummia both are off-putting to people as well, but Uh um, they're somehow easier to um, absorb because of that level of processing, right? Right. That you can kind of, you know, take that pill or eat that powder without thinking about the fact that it is a a human organ or human flesh. Mm -hmm. Um, So something similar can be said of Aztec human sacrifice. Humans were sacrificed in the prime of their lives, much like the men whose bodies were used to create mummia, right? So um, the Mexica, the Aztec, they, when they did do human sacrifices, they would pick someone who was like young and healthy, right? They're not picking like an old person. Um, Same thing with Mm -hmm. mummia. We want someone who's young in the prime of their life. The blood of the Aztec sacrifice was thought to fertilize the earth, Mm -hmm. ensuring a good harvest and... Um, the thought was that humans, as well as the community sacrifice of that person, was believed to please the gods in order to ensure health and stability of the community. So maybe not quite medical um, cannibalism, but a sense of uh, sometimes they would drink the blood and things like that. So there was some kind of medical vampirism, but it was quite mm-hmm. logical based on their scientific system that this would work. And we see a right. lot as well in Scandinavian countries who did something similar. Um, it's interesting to think of the mummia example in a similar way. Criminals were executed in order to pay for their crimes and bring harmony back to their communities. Their blood and flesh were collected and prepared and then sold for very high prices back to the community. Um, and this is not to say that, that either practice is ethically sound or anything, um, but I think it's a good exercise in implicit bias because one of them sounds so animalistic and stuff right. to to me or to one, you know, mm-hmm. Um and then the other one is like, hey, that's kind of gross, but it doesn't make you see European society in a totally different light or anything. Um, right. So it's kind of interesting to think of how really similar those um, two examples are. Right. Yeah. And, and for some reason, I recently, anyway, have seen a lot of commentary just, uh, you know, on the Internet about people saying, you know, like, Well, the Aztecs were these, like, almost inhuman, bloody, violent people, and that that means that they really were savages, Mm -hmm. right? Like, people trying to justify the European colonialism and saying that, like, well, they really were savages. Like, look at this example of things that they did. And this is the kind of episode where I think it makes us sort of think about the things that Europeans have done that we somehow have been able to turn into a sign of civilization mm-hmm. because we call it medicine. Right. That's what. That's why I called right? it the so, quote unquote most civilized kind of cannibalism because it's like, right, is there really a right. civilized kind of cannibalism? I don't know. <laughs> exactly. And that's why I think that that quote from Montagna is so interesting because he's saying that, right? Like he's saying like, what makes that what they're doing under these very certain circumstances it, as part of rituals what makes that so savage when we are executing people in barbaric ways here in Europe like there's this is like um 
<laughs> it, it, it doesn't hold up that you can point to that kind of act mm-hmm. and say that's evidence of savagery. But what we're doing, that's actually evidence of civilization. Right. Because you need that kind of control or whatever it is. Yeah, because it's um, like the state trying to impose order on criminals right. or something right. like that. Yeah. Um, but in a way, that seems like much a much more sort of vindictive and sh- um, sort of violent thing than a person and their community making the decision to sacrifice one of themselves. Right. Yeah, um, as part of a worldview, right? Right. Like, I mean, it's still shocking to think about, but it's, it's, yeah, it's just, um, I guess, you know, and that's not to say that we're not saying, well, oh, Europeans are the worst and they're horrible and no, the Aztecs right. are awesome. Like, no, there was some really gruesome um, and things that we would consider to be unethical that all right. of that indigenous communities engaged in um for sure but i guess mm-hmm. what i don't understand is why is that so different from right. you know from these unethical things that we see happening in europe um and in china uh and it's sort of like the only difference is that i have a stake in you know, right. claiming that Europeans are more civilized because that's my lineage or whatever. <laughs> like, so right. that's... Yeah, um, yeah. And yeah. just that it's kind of like, a you know, you're coming from that tradition and having that tradition be the, the tradition that wrote m- most of the world's history, right? Mm-hmm. It You kind of assume that, like, you just, you just believe that one is civilized and one is savage. Like, you, even when you try to undo that in your brain, like, it's you still are kind of like well this is a thing that Mm -hmm. came from europe and so like that's a sign of of civilization even when you are you know conscious that that's not accurate right um so yeah i think that this is a this is a really good way of thinking about not that one is as you said not that one is better or more civilized than the other but that these are things that all sorts of different cultures have done in various different ways with various different meanings. You know, it's not evidence that one was civilized and one was not. It's just kind of evidence that humans create these systems. Mm -hmm. And in a way they all have their own logic. Like yeah, the most, the crazy thing of like, "Eh, I'm going to eat my husband's penis skin or whatever. Like that sounds like, wow, that's out there. But when you hear the logic of why that is going to be helpful to your health and to the health of your community, then it's like, oh, there is a logic to this. Yes. Um, Yeah. And even if the logic is based on faulty science or something that we wouldn't consider to be science today, um, it would have seemed scientific to them and um, would have seemed rational to them. Yeah. Um, I think of it, too, as like today these are things that like make sense to us almost even in a metaphorical sense does that make Mm -hmm. sense like i'm thinking of the um the the chinese story about liu Mm -hmm. and that that is almost metaphorical she's like she's literally giving of her body Mm -hmm. to fulfill the the tenets of filial piety right Mm -hmm. like she's um it's it's kind of um, the metaphor of doing giving everything that we can to to help someone or to to save someone mm-hmm. right um and again it kind of goes back to for me like we've talked so much about the eucharist and communion right like mm-hmm. that's that's at the core of the christian belief system that god became man and literally gave up his body in a way that was very violent right Mm -hmm. for us and then we he endured that that bodily suffering exactly yeah Yeah. Mm -hmm. so there's that's that's just really interesting to think about all of these parallels and it's so funny because um theologically christian europe has that understands that idea of Uh self-sacrifice um but i don't know if it's because of the self-sacrifice of christ or or if it's in spite of it that there is not the same cultural ideal of self-sacrifice like the idea of cutting off some of your own flesh to feed your parent or whatever europeans would have thought that was ridiculous right um and stupid kind of um and you know and and barbarous or whatever um Mm -hmm. and the whole idea of like you know choosing one human to um to sacrifice to the gods or whatever 
you know, the, this, this tradition of self-sacrifice and, um, it just doesn't seem to translate the same way into the Western world as it does in other contexts. I don't know. It's just, it's weird. I mean, is it because like, oh yeah, Christ died for our sins. So like, we don't have to make sacrifices ourselves. Hmm. Like, Mm -hmm. I, I just wonder, I don't know. I don't know. Well, but that's like, you, you talked about that in the example of saints, like, kissing the body like infected bodies of lepers mm-hmm. or you know right but that is so rare it's pus, like ordinary right? folks oh super doing that, rare right it was right. like holy yeah. people um mm-hmm. whereas in china it's like regular folks like who are just there right. you know like yeah i don't know there's just there's something i can't really put my finger on it but there is some cultural thing and i'm not saying that it's um that it's, I think it's actually not unique to China. This, this, this self, this idea of self-sacrifice, or to indigenous communities. I think it's unique to Europe that there is that some strain of anti that that's that's going on. I don't, I don't know how to mm-hmm. explain it. Um, yeah, I. So, I have one last thing I want to say, just because it made me uh, laugh when we were talking about the mistranslations that led to this whole mummia thing, which by the way, you're right. I have never heard that. Mm -hmm. I've heard of mummy eating or, you know, mummy as medicine. And I'm thrilled to now know how that all sort of came about, but it made me think right away of this idea of laudable pus. Have you ever heard of this? Mm -mm. No. So there was an idea for a long time, um, and I'm not, by no means an expert on this, but it it like it kind of emerges in the medieval world in me- medieval medicine and kind of lasts in in some ways until I think in the 19th century that um, that the pus that is generated by an infected wound is itself healing, like it the 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 actual pus Mm -hmm. is a curative substance. Okay. And so when you see a wound that is creating pus, Mm -hmm. that's like an awesome thing. Like that's a really great thing. And you should collect that pus and you should give it to other people because then their wound will also create pus. And this is like a sign of healing, right? So this was this idea called laudable pus. Mm -hmm. Like, praiseworthy pus right (laughs) and the idea like i guess the origin of this people traced back to galen and said that galen had written that that pus was laudable and should be used in healing that was a mistranslation (laughs) of galen (laughs) which i think is so i mean it's terrible but it's also really funny that people like all of these doctors for centuries were like well yes i've read my galen um, but mm-hmm. they were relying on crappy translations where what Galen was actually saying is when you have a, an infection like an abscess, you should drain it. And when you see the pus coming out, that's a good thing, mm-hmm. which is true. Because you want like, to you eliminate should... it from your body. Right. Mm-hmm. You are draining an abscess. You are getting the infection out of the body. You are mm-hmm. allowing it to drain. That is actually good. Um, what he's not saying is the pus itself is the good thing <laughs> and you should just rub that stuff wherever, right? Like, yeah. um, I I just thought that that was really wonderful when I first learned about it because yeah. I was like, even, even <laughs> during the Civil War, there are some accounts, I don't know how widespread it was, that people still believe in this idea of laudable pus. Oh so all because some some people did not learn greek particularly well or <laughs> latin or whatever it was <laughs> yeah it's it, i i don't know my my translation problem came from when it was being tra- translated back from the arabic it, i the, think that that's probably the case too because okay, most of yeah. galen's works were translated and and put out there by folks like avicenna right yeah. right and then and like as far as we can tell most of the arab um scholars did do the correct translation um right for, and they were i mean sometimes they said it was the insides of mummies or whatever but they they were clear to say like the therapeutic part is the is the asphalt is like this right. mineral or whatever and it's, then europeans tried to translate the arabic <laughs> yeah then they tried to translate <laughs> and the arabic and were up. like yeah. actually mummy is just dead bodies typical um, typical 
I all right know. we are like super long we should probably cut yeah this yeah, yeah let's cut okay let's do it um well that's it for this episode oh, i hope that you uh enjoyed learning about all these disgusting things as much as i did um you can follow us uh for more thoughts and uh more episode announcements on twitter i think that we are dig underscore history we are on facebook you can join our uh dig history pod squad which is our group on facebook it's really fun um you can email us at hello at digpodcast.org yep or you can just visit our website at digpodcast.org for um show notes and transcripts and all that stuff yes absolutely oh and we should mention too that um, with lots of professors and and educators moving their things, uh, their their courses online, looking for online content, we do now have a for educators page on our website, which includes lots of ideas of how to incorporate uh, one of our episodes into a syllabus or into a lesson plan. So check that out, definitely too. Nice. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye. Mmm. Man beef. <laughs> man beef. That was um thanks to Pat. Pat was like, oh man, you should mention something about manbeef.com. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> to the nineteen or the the eighteen. Oh my god. Some scholars, namely SUNY Brockport anthropologist William Aaron. <laughs> SUNY Stone Stony Brook. What the? Fuck I don't know. You're just making it up. <laughs> okay. And then the last kind is sub dry. Sun dried. Is that? Oh, okay. <laughs> Slightly less than dried. <laughs> Sun. <laughs> um, the 1700s saw an effort to record an. Or- Oops, sorry. I just like randomly burped. I did not know that was coming. Excuse me. Apologies. Um, I did not know that was coming. <laughs> well, I mean, I could have just pulled away from the mic but i didn't um for example king francis the first of france (laughs) king francis the first of france sorry in 1586 englishman john sanderson um sorry that word sanderson looks so weird to me now i don't know why san San, because it says sans okay yeah there's an extra s okay (laughs) i'm like why does this look like this okay um sanderson San (laughs) sanderson's visiting um <clears throat> as late as 1747 english sorry your little dingle dongle is in sorry. my way <laughs> sorry and several italian saints ain't pus self-sacrificed before promptly fading fainting <laughs> before oh hang on, i can't laugh while i'm saying this of course the door the door <laughs> <laughs> The doors. Of course. <laughs> in the 700s CE, the physicians Chen. In the seven. <laughs> Chen Song Chi. No, I just yeah, okay. I started it too fast. No, I know. I mean, it's I would struggle too. In the 700s CE, the physician Cheng Sang oh, Song Chi. Okay. In the 700s CE, the physician. Why I can't even say <laughs> physician. You can't even say English words now. Oh my god. <laughs> The ideas of Galen. Hang on, I'm going to sneeze. Galen. (laughs) Galen would be concerned about your sneezing. I know. He would prescribe some human to me. (laughs) Some Um, man beef. (laughs) (laughs) Manbeef.com.